invitation hymn, if you'd like to hold, that'll be page 404. And our communion hymn this morning will be page 139 at Calvary. As we gather around the table this morning, prepared by the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, I read from the Word of God the words, Let a man examine himself, and then eat and drink worthily when concerning the Lord's body and blood. And I often question what this means. When we examine ourselves, we are to ask for forgiveness so that there is nothing that separates us from God as we partake. And then to eat and drink worthily means to be tunnel visioned on what God, on what Jesus did for you on that cross when he was beaten and then nailed to the cross for the remission of our sins. If you're taking this uh, supper in the manner directed, you should not have time to fiddle with your things or to make a distraction. Because if you don't take it worthily, then it's on your soul. As a New Testament Christian, we shouldn't be worried about others and what they may be doing, us, especially whenever we come to commune with Jesus. But our worship is between us and God, and if we are fully focused on it, then we won't have time to make a distraction or worry about others being a distraction. When we think about the pain and the suffering that Jesus endured, why would you not want to be focused? He did it because of our sin. Sin is the reason that Jesus was nailed to that tree, but thank God that on that cross, forgiveness poured out. Not that the cross has any power, but Jesus did. In Isaiah 53, verse 5, it says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Thank God that with each stripe that was laid and each nail that was driven came salvation. And after he went through all that, all he, wants to do, all he wants us to do is be obedient. Time after time we reject the, the right thing, and over and over again he forgives. Part of taking worthily and examining yourself is realizing that we don't deserve God's grace. And God's grace is why we are able to gather around this table and to commune with Jesus Christ our Savior. I'd ask the elders to pray. Satan now for this time to come around the table this morning. He wants to say we partake of this bread, his body broken upon that cross for us. Help us always to remember that we are a girl who is in the world. Help us always to be faithful to you each time. Each time we come together, go with us, 
now and be with the student services men and help us all that we might continue to be faithful. Forgive us of our sins and just save us. In Jesus' name we pray. Father in heaven, I love you this morning. Thank you for the wonderful blessings you give us each day of our lives. Thank you, Father, for this church. I pray, Father, for Brett and Brett for Nathan this morning. I ask mm-hmm. God that you be with us now as we come around your table. Thank you for this cup, which is the Son of Shed blood, was shed on the cross that we might have forgiveness of our sins. Live with you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for everything that bless us through the service today. Help us to always uplift your name and glorify your name in every way that we can. Forgive us now when we fail you. It's our prayer in your son's name. Amen. What wonderful love that God has for us. And even in a lost and dying world, he still gives us what we need and still gives us more opportunities every day to repent and to uh, turn from the ways in which we go wrong. And he still gives us that second chance each day. And uh, he gives us this opportunity now to give uh, back a small portion of what's already his, to build his kingdom and to take the word out and to lead more lost souls through his word into the church. And so, uh, Jamie, I'd ask if you would pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, God, we do thank you, Father, for the opportunity and the help you've given us, Father, to gather in the table today. 
Father, we ask, Father, that this offering we've got to receive, Father, we pray, Father, that we use the money, Father, that you would have us to use it, Father, for that which we can. We pray a blessing on each and every one that's here, Father. And God, we just pray a financial flesh loss, Father, that we give it all unto you for the sake of our progression. Father, stay with us and watch over us and guide us. Most of all, Father, forgive us for our failures. In Jesus' name we pray. Good morning. We are blessed, aren't we? The Lord's good. The Lord's merciful. Uh, I look outside and all the beauty that we see around, even in the dead of winter, uh, we see that the Lord uh, is gracious and good. And our question may be sometimes, why? Well, I hope to answer that in my message today. Why is the Lord so good, so loving, so merciful? We attribute it to his great love, and that is true. It's a love that you and I could not express. It's a love that you and I could not understand. But I hope there's, we prove today that there's a, a, a reason in the Bible that God does what he does and beyond our capability of understanding. I do want to make a couple of quick announcements. First of all, we need to come up with a new banner. This was hung here too long, and the reason for that is we've missed a lot of church and a lot of things have gone on. Uh, so out there is the uh, my little trash can, my little stainless steel trash can. Put your thoughts in there, your ideas of a new banner slogan. Someone uh, told me one that sounded good was uh, be still and know that I am God, and that's good. That's what we need to do this day and time. But we got to get our new banner up. Uh, so put your suggestions out here, and we will discuss those, and we'll choose one and get moving forward on that. Uh, you hear me give a lot of uh, study and a lot of uh, information and facts that I uh, hear and read and so on and so forth about everything going on in this country today and with the virus and this, that, and the other. I encourage everybody here and everybody watching to pull up on your computer and uh, from a few days ago and read the study from John Hopkins University on uh, this last uh, couple of years of charades. This last couple of years of stuff that has gone on, I encourage you to talk to read people that have actually done studies now, we listen to doctors and people that run clinics and this, that, and the other that have never done a study in their whole lives. These men, these doctors are professional have done studies, and you ought to know the truth, don't you think? So pull it up. If you want to know the facts about what all's going on and has been going on and what's good, what fights it, what a person should do, then you need to read this study. And don't expect to hear it on the main news. Now, all your lives, ABC, NBC, all of them, they've given John Hopkins said this, John Hopkins said that. Not one peep about this study because it goes against every lie that they're telling on the news today. So I encourage you, pull it up and read and study it and learn what a true and true professional say has truly been going on and what your reaction and response and a country's response ought to be to it. It's in the report by professionals. We'll leave it at that. Earlier this week, sitting there on the couch, we were studying, come to our next uh, chapter in 2 Samuel in our Bible study. I came to a passage 
Go on to 2 Samuel chapter 11 with me. I come to a passage, or we came to the passage about David and Bathsheba. A part of scripture that is talked about, discussed, explained frequently. Most of us know the story of David and Bathsheba. And if we get to 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter... I'll wait till I hear the pages stop. There's a lot of pages. I'm going to start reading in verse 2. And it came to pass in the evening time that David arose from off his bed, walked upon the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after this woman, Who is she? And one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David sent messengers, brought her back to him. She came in and to him. He laid with her, and she was sent back to her house. Verse 5 says, And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, Hey, I am with child. Now if we keep reading the next few verses, you're going to find out that David sent Joab, which was a leader of the military, and said, Joab, send Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, back here to me. Uriah comes in. And David pretty much says, hey, you've been at it. You've been a going at it. How's everything going? Why don't you take some time off and go down and spend some time, private time with your wife? David knew she was pregnant with his child. So he thought, well, if I can get Uriah to have relations with her, we can claim it's his. But Uriah went outside the door and laid down there and stayed. David brought him in when he heard he didn't go home to be with his wife and to eat and to drink and to have a few days off. David said, why didn't you go home like I told you to? And Uriah said, oh, Uriah said, oh my goodness, how can I go home, eat and drink and relax and lay with my wife while all of my brethren are off at war? I cannot do that. Now if you pick up there in verse 14, after he said that the next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab, the leader of the military. Check this out. He wrote the letter to Joab, but he put the letter rolled up in Uriah's hand and said, Hey, take this to Joab. Do you know what the letter said? Do whatever you got to do to kill Uriah. Put him in the hottest battle up front. And you know what happened? He delivered his own death sentence. You're right, did. Didn't even know it. Put him in the hottest battle and he was put to death. He was killed in battle. Verse 26 says, Their wife, that's Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead. She mourned for her husband. And when the morning was past, M-O-U-R-N, morning, when her morning was past, David sent and fetched her into his house, and she became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Would you say David sinned here? More than once, too. David commits his sin with Bathsheba. He commits sin. I want y'all to listen to me closely. You ain't too tired to listen to this message today, I promise you. And if you're paying attention, it's too exciting to even think about catching a wink. All right? So uh, pay attention to me. Pay attention to what this story is telling us today. David commits his sin with Bathsheba, makes sure that her husband is killed in battle. Then we find that the Lord sends the prophet Nathan to David to rebuke him. Second Samuel chapter 12. The Lord sent Nathan unto David. 
he came unto him and said, David, there were two men in the city. One was real rich and the other poor. The rich man had all kinds of flocks. The poor man had one little ewe sheep, one little sheep. And they loved it so much that they raised it up like one of his own children. He'd eat, slept in the house with him. He'd eat from the table with him. And don't nobody go look at me and say, see, we can do dogs the same way there, Christine. <laughs> this is just a story. <laughs> she gave me an awful time, but I ain't even going into it today. <laughs> but it said that the one little sheep with the poor man would come in, count it as one of his children. He loved that sheep that much. And this rich man had everything. Well, a stranger come in town to see the rich man. You can read this about exactly the way I'm telling you here. Stranger come in to see the rich man. Instead of the rich man going to get one of the sheep from his flock and dressing it to serve as food to the stranger, he went and took the, one poor, the poor man's one little sheep and left him with nothing. And if you read there towards the end, uh, down to, uh, I don't know, 7, 8, 9, and 10, whatever it was down through there, it says that David become wroth. He become angry. And he said, we're going to get revenge on this person, whoever this man is. As the Lord liveth, this man that's done this thing shall die. That's what David said. And in verse 7, Nathan looks at David and says, David, you're that man. You had everything. God give you everything. And you took the one most precious thing of your eye, the head tight. You took his wife and then you took his life. Listen to what the Lord said to him in verse 7. The Lord God said, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house, your master's wives unto thy bosom. I gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you whatever you asked for, David. Why, verse 9, have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword, and you took his wife to be your wife. And you slain him with a sword of the children of Ammon, my enemies who I despise. Can't you hear the Lord saying this? Thus saith the Lord, Behold... I will raise up evil out of your own house. I'm going to take your wives from before your eyes and give them to thy neighbor, and they will lie with them in your sight and in the time of this son. For what this thing before all Israel and before the son. Whew. Rough time, ain't it? Look at verse 13 and 14. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan told him, said, The Lord has put away your sin. He's forgiven you. You're not going to die. How be it? Because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme him. The child that is born unto you shall surely Die. You know, sometimes you can read something over and over and over and over, and it seems as if one day that the Spirit of the Lord just makes something stand out to you. You've noticed it, you've understood it, but for some reason a deeper meaning seems to come from what you happen to be reading at this time. And this is what I thought of. If David... As stated in, in Acts chapter 12, if David, a man after God's own heart, if David, a man that was a shepherd boy, designated, even while he was a shepherd boy, to be king over God's people, the one that defeated 
Goliath the giant with one little stone and a slingshot, the writer of 70 plus psalms, if David, if his sin could cause the enemies of God to blaspheme, then what about mine? And what about yours? Everybody look at me just a second. Can you sin in such a way that you bring blasphemy upon the Lord? That's something we need to think about it. King David did it. God looked down and said, David, that's a man after my own heart. That man caused the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme God through his actions. Throughout God's word. We read and study Old and New Testament and we see that God loves his people greatly. Those that follow him, that ad uh, adhere to his word, obey his commandments, he loves them greatly. But you know what he's most concerned about? Throughout his word? You know what he's most concerned about? Throughout the word? Do you know what he's most concerned about throughout the word, Old and New Testament alike? Do you know what he's most concerned about? His name. Did you know that? A lot of you didn't know that, I don't think. Gee, God is concerned with his name. Numerous times through the scripture we see and read phrases like, For my name's sake. God says, for my name's sake. This baby had to die because the people knew what David done. And he said, because you give my enemies a reason to blaspheme my name, times are going to get rough. God's main concern with anything is his name's sake. And I don't believe Christians understand that very well today. Maybe never have. Let me give you a prime example of what I mean. Flip ahead to Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36. And we're going to pick up in verse 16. Ezekiel 36, verse 16. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, says Ezekiel, and this is what the Lord said, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their doings. Not by the way I told them to do it. Not the way I told them to live. No, they did it their way and they defiled the land. Their way was before me as the uncleanness of a removed woman. Wherefore and for this reason I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land and for the idols wherewith they had polluted the land. And I scattered them among the heathen. They were dispersed from their homelands throughout countries. According to their way and according to their doings, I judged them. But when they entered into the heathen, when they went in into those lands and amongst those people, they profaned what? My what? Holy name. When they said unto him, well, These are the people of the Lord that have gone out from forth the land, but I had pity on them for what? Mine what? Are you getting a picture of what God's all about so far? I had pity on them for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whether they went. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, 
Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sake, O house of Israel, but I do this for my what? Holy name's sake. Which you have profaned amongst the heathens where you went. I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned amongst the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them for them to see how you're acting and what you're doing. You're profaning my name. But I'm going to have pity and I will sanctify you before their eyes. I'm going to take you from amongst the heathen, gather you out, gather you out of all the countries and bring you back to your own land. I'll sprinkle you with clean water and you shall be clean. From all of your filthiness and from your idols will I cleanse thee. A new heart will I give you. A new spirit will I put in you. And I'll take away that stony heart out of your flesh. And I'll give you a heart of flesh. I don't know how much more I want to read here. Let's keep reading though. Uh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you shall keep my judgments and do them. Ye shall dwell in the land that I give to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I'll be your God, and I will save you from your uncleanness. I will call for the corn, and it will increase. I will lay no famine upon you. I will multiply the fruit of the tree, increase the field, that you receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. Then, after all this good I've done to you, then after all of this, you will remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good. And you shall loathe yourselves in your own sight because of your iniquities and your abominations. Not for your sakes do I this, saith the Lord God. Be known this unto you. I'm not doing this for your name's sake says the Lord, be this known unto you. Understand, God says, what I do, I do for my name's sake, not you. Do you understand where I'm going now? Do you understand what Nathan was saying to David? Do you understand what Ezekiel? Yes, he loves us. Yes, he cares for us. Yes, he sent Jesus to die for us. Yes, he gave us the plan of salvation to repent. And if we will be baptized, well, our sins will be washed away and we'll be saved, raised to walk as Christians in newness of life. Yes, he done all that, but not for you, for his name's sake. Do you understand that? God hasn't changed any. We got to quit thinking we're something so special and so righteous and so good. We do what the Bible says. We follow his word the way it says it and we bring him honor and glory because he demands that for his name's sake. Why does he love you? Why does he care for you? Why does he forgive you? Did you understand what he told the children of Israel and Ezekiel? It ain't for your sake. It's for my name's sake. My great name's sake. God is so much above us and so more powerful, so great, so righteous, so loving in every way that his name's sake should all that be that matters to us. Amen? And David lost a, a time in his life, lost focus of that. And he brought the enemies of God to blaspheme that wonderful great name. And God said, I ain't going to let this by. I can't let this by. We see in these verses we read... Over and over, God refers to his name. Did you get that? Over and over. Then he goes on to make a promise of giving the people great things and wonderful gifts. And Of course, this is looking forward to the coming of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. But even then, he says, I'm going to make this good for you. I'm going to make that good for you. Why? For their sake? He said, no, for my name's sake. Understand what I'm telling you. What you receive is a gift from me. 
What you receive is love from me. What you receive is goodness and righteous from me for my name's sake. God, George, maybe if we started praying our prayers that way. God, help me and heal me and give me this and direct me there and help this to go this way and this way. Not for my sake, God, but that for your name's sake that I'm able to praise and to glorify you and that all people see. Do you notice that's what God said right there, John? I'm going to do these good things for you so that your enemies see. What is the purpose in that? That they'll see God working for them, not how good they are, but for God's name's sake. Did you catch that? We got to quit asking and praying for things for us, for us, for us. And instead, seek the blessings of God and the things he does for us as occasion and opportunity to lift up his great name to the heathen and the people. Look at what Peter says. It's something very similar to this in Peter. First Peter, excuse me, the second chapter. First Peter, the second chapter. Verse 9, listen to what he says we are. I want you to pay attention. First Peter, second chapter, verse 9. You, Christians, is who he's talking to, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him, that's God, that hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then he goes on in verse 11 and 12, says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, that's us as Christians, passer throughs, abstain from fleshly lust which war against your soul. Have your conversation or your conduct honest among the Gentiles. That's among the lost. Have your conduct honest among the lost. That even though they speak evil against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, your conduct, your life in which they view, they may, when they behold that, glorify God in the day of the visitation. Why are we to make sure that in public and around that we're doing God justice? Because of his great name's sake and that it receives honor and glory and praise even by the heathen, even by the lost. Take a look, it says, this world goes down the drain everywhere. Look at this Christian family. Look at this Christian family. This, this church, look at the blessings in which they're receiving. And let me tell you, the heathen, the lost, they pay attention. They know. They see. So Peter says you've got to get away from that fleshly lust. Get away from that frame of mind which keeps us included uh, committing such things as slander, division, Anger makes us arrogant. These are all works of the flesh. These are a frame of the mind. Keeps us cursing, boasting. That keeps us prideful. Keeps us unmerciful. Telling lies. Keeps us disobedient to our parents. Keeps us disobedient to the word of God when we reject our roles as a husband and a wife. You know what? I look at this world today and the reason that there's a problems in the world today that we see, it comes back to the fact that people are not in the family and living the Christian family life as they should. The children and the mamas and the daddies the same. The word of God, Paul, makes it very clear that the uh, children to be obedient to their parents. They're to listen. They're to do what they're told to do. They're to accept the instruction respectfully. You don't see that in a lot of houses and in school today. Paul says and Peter says that a husband and a wife, that they're, uh, they, they come together, they're one body, they're one mind, they're one desire. Their desire 
is to be for each other, for one another, emotionally and physical. Their emotion, they're to come together as one. And to stay that way, and there'll be no division in that marriage. Be no hate or anger. Paul teaches on the road, or on the roles of spouses, how the husband is to treat the wife and the wife's to be towards the husband. Oh, my goodness. Hey, people, the Bible ain't an ice cream shop. You don't go and pick the flavor that you want, or you don't go and pick the verses that you want and the verses that you don't want. Our country's in an awful state because of what's going on in the Christian family. I was telling some people this week, and even you, you look out today, the professionalism is a thing that's gone in this country. Attorneys that show up in big meetings and important meetings with uh, uh, blue jeans and a throw-on shirt and uh, look like they're going out to a bar or something. You get look at doctors and nurses on their way to work or in the hospitals or in their private practices. You can't tell if they've come in to go to work or to go jogging. They got their black tight hose pulled up where you see every wrinkle and piece of cellulite and fat and everything all over them. And here they are, supposed to be a professional. There ain't no professionalism anymore. Like I said, you can't tell if they're coming to work or going jogging or going to work out. What happened to professionalism in this country? It used to be if a man was going to work and he was a professional or she was, you could tell that by the way they were dressed and the way they acted. Well, it ain't no different with a Christian. Well, we're out here, people ought to be able to see us and know that we're children of God. If we ain't practicing it at home and we ain't practicing it in the church, we're not going to practice it out here for the heathen or the lost to see. We'll continue to be fulfill the lust of the flesh that Peter warned us against in fornication. Self-worship. You remember my example of self-worship? If you're worshiping yourself, you ain't worshiping God. If all you're doing is taking selfies and pictures and posting as hard as you can go, that's self-worship. You ain't a God worshiper. You're a self-worshiper. You got a problem with people in provocative actions provocative language, provocative dress. And he comes up on prom season or a wedding. It's ridiculous the way some of these dresses and the way these women and the young women dress today. No matter the length of the skirt, the slits all the way up to the waist. And they have no back in it all the way down below the waist. And these are supposed to be righteous, Christian, godly people. Listen, we need to wake up and realize that we're here promoting the name of God. And that we may very well defame him or cause injury to his name by our actions. As the world sees us out. Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 16. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men. Is that what he said? that they may see your good works. Glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let me ask you in your relationship, husband and wife. Let me ask you in your job that you go to every day. Let me ask you as a neighbor, as a mama, a daddy, grandma, granddaddy, aunt, uncle. Do you let your light shine that people see your good works? Your conduct as a Christian that they may glorify God, do you? Does your spouse glorify God because of you? Does your co-workers glorify God because of you and the goodness, the good deeds, the kindness? What about your neighbors, your in-laws? Huh? If we don't, instead we've got to be bringing dishonor to the name of God. If we're not bringing honor, there's no medium ground there. There's no gray area there. You're doing one of the two. We're called to stand up and to speak what is the truth, the truth that we're taught in God's Word. We're told to share this truth in love. The Apostle Paul did this boldly, sharing the truth, writing to the churches on how for us to do the same because he understood the importance of living right before people so they see that you are a Christian. The Apostle Paul understood the importance there. So where he went, he spoke the truth. 
and he stood upon the principles of God's word and he did not vary there so that his father in heaven would be glorified. Now back to David and Nathan in 2 Samuel 12, 14. His great punishment was because what he did led the enemies of God to blaspheme, to mock, to make fun of his name. I don't want to do anything that causes the enemies of God to blaspheme the name of God, do you? I mess up plenty. There's things that said or done aplenty. But I don't want to make the mistake of causing the enemies of God to blaspheme his holy, perfect name because I'm supposed to be more pure. I'm supposed to be a Christian. I'm supposed to be separate. I'm supposed to not be like the world. And I have to be careful not to be like them. We need to desire to be one that brings glory to God's name. Amen? Your desire don't need to be uh, for success in this world to meet your goals and desires and ambition, our desire needs to be that in everything we say and do, everything we wear, everywhere we go, that we bring honor to God's name, that they can look at us and see that we are different and that we honor his name should be our number one priority amongst the heathen and other Christians. Because John, Jesus tells us in John the 10th, 13th chapter, by this all the world will know you're my disciples if you what? Love one another. The world's watching. The heathen are watching. The lost are watching. And they've got to be able to know that you're a follower of Jesus Christ and that you're different than the rest of the world. You see, we're his disciples. He doesn't follow us. We're supposed to follow him. We're supposed to obey him. If you're a Christian here, you bear his name. It ain't your name anymore. It ain't your desires or your thoughts or your beliefs or your feelings. It's about the Lord, and I want you to know, no matter how this world may look today, the Lord is in total control. He is in total control. And when he decides that it's time to clean the mess up, however he decides that is, you'll want to make sure you're on his side. And the only way that is possible is by continually bringing glory and honor to his name through your life as a child of God. We'll either choose to surrender and be a part of his way or we'll choose not to surrender to his way. And that's all of it. Like I said a while ago, the Bible's not an ice cream shop. You don't sit there and say, oh, I'm going to be good to people and I'm going to help people. I'm going to treat my wife like a dog. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, but I'll never correct my children. You don't get to pick and choose out of the Bible what's okay for you. We have to be obedient to it that we bring glory and honor to God. And I'm going to tell you, we live in such a world right now. It's such a crazy world and crazy country right now that we have the greatest opportunity of our lives to be a light, to be something good, something solid, something that people can look at and praise God. That's impossible, though, if you're not a Christian. For his name's sake, he sent Jesus to die for our sins so that he could have a peculiar people, so he could have a royal priesthood, so he could have somebody special that was his. For him, for his name's sake, he sent Jesus to die on a cross that we could be saved that we can have a way away from our sin and our evilness for his namesake. I want you to come forward. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. I want you to come forward if you're not a Christian and make today the day that you repent.
and are baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins, that your soul is saved, that the name of God be rejoiced today, that the name of God be praised today. Will you do that? Will you, can we change our minds and get our minds and thoughts away from us and get it back to a desire that everything that we do we bring glory and honor to God because that's what it's all about. God made that clear in Ezekiel, did he not? It's about his name's sake. And if we love it like we should, we'll act like we should. We'll be and follow his word like we should. But you've got to be a Christian first for any of that to matter. We ask you to come this morning if you're not. We'll stand and sing verse 1. <laughs>